Well, I'm very happy to welcome you all today to our Bannon Forum event, Gandhi Technology and the Human Spirit with Dr. Rohit Chopra. Um, and just before we get started, a quick note, <clears throat> as we go through today, you're welcome to post questions in the Q&A um, chat function. Um, and we can come back to those during the Q&A session. I can read those. Um, but also, we also have the ability to unmute you. So if you'd prefer to wait and raise your hand when we get to Q&A, I can also um, unmute you, although I can't, you can't show your video, but we can allow you to ask a question through audio. Um, so just keep that in mind. Um, but I'm happy to welcome you all here and finally be able to host this lecture, was, which was postponed due to COVID last year. And there's been a topic of conversation between Rohit and I really since almost since I started in this job. So it's, it's great we're finally able to, to make this happen. And I, and I look forward to a great um, event. Um, it also emerges from Rohit's position as abandoned fellow for 2019, 2020 and the Ignatian Center's Tech and Human Spirit Initiative um, and work we were doing last year together. An underlying thrust of the Tech and the Human Spirit program was a desire to explore the profound and complex questions about technology's impact on what it means to be human. And as a Jesuit institution, that exploration must include mind, body, and spirit. And the human spirit in this sense is a place in each of us where questions of identity, meaning, purpose, and human interconnection exist. Um, and I'm grateful for Rohit's contribution to this ongoing exploration of the human spirit here at Santa Clara um, and how we understand the role of technology in shaping what it means to be human and its broader implications for our ability to flourish as individuals and as a society. Um, I know many of you already know Rohit, but um, I want to introduce him briefly. Rohit Chopra is an associate professor in the Department of Communication at Santa Clara University. His research centers on global media and cultural identity, digital media, and media and memory. He's the author and editor or editor of four books, most recently, The Gita in a Global World, Ethical Action in Age of Flux, which will be published by Westland this year, and the virtual Hindu Rashtra, Saffron Nationalism and New Media, published by Harper Collins in 2019. Rohit also writes for a range of media outlets in India and the United States, and he is the founder and host of the podcast India Explained. Um, so I welcome Rohit and I look forward to um, today's conversation. Okay, thank you very much, Dr. Willis. I'm uh, <clears throat> very grateful to Aaron. I'm uh, grateful to the Bannon Forum and the Ignatian Center and to Santa Clara University. It's, uh, you know, very, it's, it's, there's something about our commitment to the whole person to social justice. Uh, which I think resonates with the topic of today's talk. And um, I'm very grateful and thankful to all of you for being here. I know that after about a year of being on this, um, you know, under lockdown, and we are all kind of zoomed out. So thank you very much for making the time uh, and the effort. So I'm going to jump into my you know, presentation uh, right away. I'll share screen in a second. If you hear some very mild snoring in the background, which won't interrupt up, that is my dog, Riley, who has decided something is happening and she will not uh, stay in her crate and has just decided to join us here. All right, so let me go ahead and share the screen and uh, you know, we'll be on our way. Um, okay, thank you. Uh, and I'm gonna try and keep my talk to about 30, 35 minutes. That should give us plenty of time for questions. I'm gonna try not to make it too pedantic. I will make some sort of re you know, references to other academics that's kind of occupational hazard. Um, and I'll try and be brief, uh, you know, that's uh, sort of brevity is not really an Indian strength. Uh, there was, a, 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 you know, a, India's representative for the UN uh, in the aftermath of independence gave a 10 hour speech in the United Nations. And according to a lot of people, that's exactly the moment when India lost all sympathy for its position on the Kashmir cause. Um, anyway, Gandhi technology and the human spirit. Here we are. So just a fun thing to start with, you know, Gandhi is uh, as I was doing, uh, you know, research for this talk and and the book that I have coming up, so let me just sort of plug that a little shamelessly. Uh, it's called uh, The Gita in a Global World, the Bhagavad Gita, Ethical Action in an Age of Flux. Uh, Gandhi was the greatest reader of the Gita, not a literal reader, but the most well-known reader of the Gita. So when I was doing research for this, I, I came across a lot of interesting stuff. And uh, something I found recently is uh, on the American Academy of Pediatrics, uh, there's a doctor who says that children who refuse to vaccinate and parents who are, you know, vaccine averse, uh, doctors should actually follow Gandhi's techniques of civil disobedience, uh, you know, refusing to eat or going on a one day strike or a fast to get them to do that. Uh, but, you know, I'm, I'm, this is my reference is only partly facetious because Gandhi is so many things to so many people. 
Uh, and to start with, we have to kind of, I think, understand, uh, you know, or just take a look at all the different Gandhis. Uh, and for someone who is of Indian origin, I'm an American citizen, but uh, I'm an Indian by origin. I've spent, you know, close to half my life in the U.S. Uh, Gandhi also has a particular significance and force. Uh, and, uh, you know, many years ago when I was a graduate student at Emory University, uh, I met the great Indian writer Amitav Ghosh. Uh, I had the privilege of meeting him uh, when he had come there. He met a bunch of us graduate students. Uh, he made a very interesting observation, which was that Indians, uh, we approach the nation and we understand the nation through family. Uh, so Gandhi, in as much as he is, you know, very powerfully associated with the Indian nation, is also someone who all of us as Indians uh, or people of Indian origin uh, kind of understand through family. So I'll just share two very brief anecdotes about family connections. Uh, my wife's grandmother, uh, Kala Shahani, she was, uh, uh, you know, she was uh, active in the Indian freedom struggle. Uh, she's the most, she was the most kind, gentle, wonderful person I've, I've ever met. When she was 12, she attended a lecture, a talk by Gandhi, and she was so moved by it that she decided that she would only wear khadi and cotton, Indian homespun cotton for the rest of her life, uh, and live according to Gandhian values. And she really lived that. Uh, through her life, throughout her life, she never uh, used a single object that was made outside India. And this didn't come out of any kind of, you know, xenophobia or, or uh, you know, hyper-nationalism, not at all. The only exception to that was she liked um, little uh, Tic Tacs. So when we would visit India, we would take Tic Tacs for her and the green ones and the, uh, the white ones were her favorite. And then my grandfather, who my maternal grandfather, who is... Uh, uh, in Lahore, he, which is part of undivided India, now Pakistan, uh, he was a lawyer, a successful lawyer, and he was briefly involved with the freedom movement, and he was jailed. And he had written a letter to Gandhi, and Gandhi wrote back. Gandhi was a great letter writer. And I remember, you know, as a, as, as a school child talking to my grandfather, and, and my grandfather said that he was a great man, but he was, uh, he was no saint. Uh, so that's just something that kind of stuck with me. So... Uh, just moving on. So in the Indian imagination, Gandhi is affectionately called Bapu, or which means father. And he's commonly known as, you know, the father of the nation. Uh, and there used to be a lot of these silly and somewhat tasteless jokes about that in school, which I won't go into. Uh, but there's no reason why Gandhi should be exempt from humor. Uh, but today, what's very interesting, as Ashish Nandi, a political commentator, uh, points out in a recent article that, you know, under the regime of the Hindu nationalist government, particularly this one, uh, Savarkar, uh, who was the founder of the ideology of Hindu nationalism, which inspired Gandhi's assassin, that Savarkar has now become the unofficial father of the nation. And Gandhi has become a kind of stepfather of the Indian nation state. Uh, and, you know, Narendra Modi, the Indian Prime Minister, a couple of years ago, astonishingly wrote a piece on Gandhi's birthday, which is 2nd October, about why the world needs Gandhi. Uh, and to me, that's a bit like Donald Trump writing an op-ed about, uh, you know, why the world needs uh, the lessons of, uh, you know, Dr. King. So, uh, I'll be coming to the railways as part of, you know, the Gandhi's interest and comments on technology. But I just want to signal that there is a moment uh, where Gandhi actually becomes the Gandhi we know. And, and many of you may be familiar with this, but those of you who aren't, uh, this was a moment when Gandhi, who was a Western trained lawyer from England and was practicing law in South Africa, uh, he was on his way to meet a client. And on June 7, 1893, at uh, the, the station of Pieter Maritzburg in South Africa, he was thrown out of a train for refusing to move to the section uh, for colored people. Uh, and the film Gandhi, there are clips of this. This is a Oscar winning film. Uh, you know, it's a complex film. They, we, we can talk about that a little bit in the question and answer. Uh, something very interesting happened when I was watching the, the clip. I actually found it very hard to watch that clip. And something about that just told me that, you know, the significance of Gandhi affects anyone who is Indian in very deep ways, including people who actually loathe Gandhi. Uh, you know, you, whether he inspires you or he intrigues you or he evokes 
negative sentiments in you. He's not someone who can be who can be ignored. So a train played a role in the transformation of Gandhi. And once he was thrown out, that was kind of the turning point in his political consciousness. Uh, later on, once Gandhi, you know, moved to India and uh, became active in really mobilizing the masses, so to speak, and playing a key role in the transformation of nationalism, uh, which was an elite limited movement into a kind of mass movement, trains were absolutely central to Gandhi's project. And here's, uh, you know, one two minute clip of Gandhi and his wife Kasturba traveling uh, across India by train. So let me just see. Writing's not that easy, but Grammarly can help. This sentence is grammatically correct. Oh, sorry. Okay, I believe you can't see the video. Let me just start it again. I think. Uh... I think okay. Sorry, sorry. I think you have to unshare and then reshare. Yeah, I have to unshare and reshare again. Sorry about that. Let me do that. So let's go here back to Zoom. All right, thank you. There we go. And I'm just going to start this. The train was really a way in which Gandhi got to uh, to know India, and India got to know Gandhi. Uh, now, in the global imagination, too, you know, Gandhi was already a well-known figure. And God bless YouTube. There's amazing stuff on YouTube. We won't see this video, but some of you might be interested in seeing it later. Uh, there's this marvelous clip of Gandhi actually visiting London in 1931. And he decided to stay at a shelter for the homeless. And he was very, very warmly greeted by poor people uh, in England. So even at the, you know, in a sense at the, this is not quite the high noon of empire, uh, but you know, this is the peak of the freedom struggle really, uh, the last two decades or so, Gandhi had widespread support in, in, uh, in, in England. Just going to shut this. Just give me a second. All right, here we go. Uh, now, I also found something very fascinating, which is again a link of Gandhi and technology. Uh, Gandhi had been used in a famous Apple ad about thinking different. So, so let's watch this. This is a fun thing to see. There we go. It's about a minute long and it has all the Silicon Valley rhetoric. Here's to the crazy ones, the misfits, the rebels, the troublemakers, the round pegs in the square holes, the ones who see things differently. They're not fond of rules and they have no respect for the status quo. You can quote them, disagree with them, glorify or vilify them about the only thing you can't do is ignore them because they change things 
they push the human race forward. While some may see them as the crazy ones, we see genius. Because the people who are crazy enough to think they can change the world are the ones who do. All right, I'm not quite sure what Gandhi would have made of Apple or of Zoom for that matter, but uh, it's a very, very fascinating ad which can be unpacked. And then this was very odd. I didn't know that Gandhi was a football legend or soccer legend, but apparently on the FIFA website, the International Football Association, there's a write-up about him. So the man continues to surprise. Now, I know this is a bit of a long setup, but there's a kind of logic to it because there's a particular way in which one needs to read Gandhi. Um, and he is a kind of elusive figure, despite the massive volumes that he read. Um, uh, sorry, that he wrote. So while always generalizes about Gandhi at one's own peril, I want to just start with that caveat. Uh, it's important, and especially for someone who is of Indian origin, to see him beyond hagiography. And I remember talking to a family member who said that, you know, Gandhi was so revered, and he still is, that it was difficult for us to even criticize him. But of course, we we shouldn't be hesitant to criticize him. Um, and interestingly, Gandhi was actually not very well read. His uh, writings are enormous in volume. His collected works are 98 volumes. Uh, but, you know, he wrote a lot. So he wrote a lot more than he read. And in this respect, he's he's a bit like the current crop of Indian writers. Uh, people like Chetan Bhagat, for instance, those of you who may have heard of him. Uh, he's been described as a critical traditionalist. So he was a man of complexities and contradictions. He was a symbol of liberation for large numbers of people, but he was also a hegemonic figure. Uh, and no one felt this more acutely than the Indian leader, Dr. Ambedkar, who was from an uh, untouchable caste uh, and who was you know, quite opposed to Gandhi on some very strategic matters and significant matters about the future of the Republic, about questions of rights and about Hinduism and caste oppression. Uh, he was radical in some respects, yet conservative in others. And I don't know if any of you have seen some of the recent uh, articles, you know, in the life of uh, Black Lives Matter protests, when in South Africa, statues of Gandhi were toned down for some remarks, racist remarks that he made uh, in the early part of his career. He is not a systematic thinker, but he is a very strategic thinker. And his Hinduism was eclectic. It was inspired by many, many sources. Uh, you know, and I want to just quickly say that in terms of today's post-millennial woke culture, uh, Gandhi would have been cancelled right away. There's no question about that. So, you know, I think these complexities come out with regard to all his ideas, including technology. And very briefly, let me look at two, you know, ideas for which Gandhi is like particularly well known in the Indian imagination and in the global uh, scheme of things. So the first is Gandhi and poverty. Uh, Gandhi valorized poverty and asceticism, right? And this was, you know, his his the iconic picture of Gandhi is with a with a weaving loom, uh, you know, dressed in nothing but a loincloth. The Churchill, Churchill called him a half naked fakir, uh, which is an Indian Urdu term for a mendicant. Uh, you know, who goes around begging for arms. Uh, so very few, you know, possessions. Uh, he was also inspired by, you know, Christian figures who lived in poverty, for instance. But Gandhi did say that poverty is the worst form of violence. And in terms of Gandhi being strategic, there was an element of political theater to Gandhi's commitment, public commitment to poverty. So uh, Sarojini Naidu, who was an Indian uh, uh, political figure, a writer, feminist, and the first a uh, woman to head the Indian National Congress, she once wryly observed that, you know, it costs India a fortune to keep Gandhi poor or to keep Gandhi in poverty. Uh, similarly, with regard to Gandhi's ideas of nonviolence, now that's the idea that he's most, uh, you know, commonly associated with. And it's an idea that, you know, inspired Dr. King as well. Um, just as civil disobedience was an idea that Gandhi took from Thoreau, and then uh, it was also an idea that inspired Dr. King. His idea of nonviolence is actually indebted more to Western thought than to Indian traditions. And as Ashish Nandi, again, I think 
one of the two most insightful commentators on Gandhi, along with Indian historian Ramachandra Guha, he says that this was strategically and tactically aimed at Western pacifist movements to garner international support for the anti-colonial freedom movement. Uh, so the idea of India and Hinduism as non-violent is actually a creation of Gandhi. And, you know, it's, I find it very ironic. My, I work on Hindu nationalism, online Hindu nationalism. I know that world very well. Uh, Indians who, you know, criticize Gandhi will often talk about Hinduism as a peaceful religion. And that is some an idea they owe to Gandhi. So as an Indian writer, uh, Nirat C. Chaudhary, he says that in, in all of Indian thought, there are precisely two references to, to in Hindu thought, specifically to, to nonviolence. There's Ashoka, who embraced nonviolence after commit converting to Buddhism. And then there's Gandhi. So, you know, again, just something about Gandhi kind of creating the reality that he claimed he was representing. Now, let's come to Gandhi and technology. And we find, you know, all of these complexities at work. I should mention at the outset that Gandhi's critique of technology is aimed at industrial technology, which was experienced by Indians as part of colonial modernity. And industrial technology, sure, it brought some benefits. You know, we can argue about that. Economists see this quite differently from historians. But under colonial rule, for instance, the industrialized production of cotton was an instrument of Indian exploitation, right? What was happening was that they would the the uh, you know Indian cotton was banned from certain markets, but uh, you would have the the British initially you know moving cotton from India, but then also purchasing cotton from North America. So there's an American connection here as well, and then completely flooding the Indian market with industrialized, cheap, mass-produced goods, um, and uh, you know and that again gives you some context for why Gandhi chose to adopt uh, you know, the loom uh, as a symbol of indigenous artisanal technology. Uh, again, he kind of was inspired by British movements here too. Uh, why he made that one of the centerpieces and one of the most powerful symbols of his way of being and his, his kind of political model. Uh, so if there are two commodities that uh, I think played a very central role in, in empire, one was cotton and then the other one was opium. Uh, opium financed really the British Empire and in India, and it did so as late as the 1920s. And again, happy to talk more about this. There's a beautiful novel by, again, the, the Indian novelist I mentioned, Amitav Ghosh, The Sea of Poppies on that. So Gandhi's views, of course, you know, across 98 volumes, he wrote a lot, but his critique of technology is most pointedly and sharply made in a very interesting book called Hind Swaraj, which was written in 1909 when Gandhi was uh, on a ship. So, uh, and, you know, the ship is again, uh, it's it's a product of modern technology. So there's an I irony there and a bit of hypocrisy. And in the book, Gandhi details the conditions for self-governance. Now, the word he uses is a word called Swarajya. And like, you know, many Indian words, Dharma, Karma, Yog, it's a word that's very hard to translate. Swarajya means self-rule. Uh, but it also means rule over the individual self. Uh, so it's got an individual dimension and a collective political dimension. And the subtitle of Hind Swaraj is Home Rule for India. Uh, so Gandhi wrote the book in Gujarati, an Indian language, uh, and he later translated it into English. And it was actually banned as seditious by the South African government. He was on his way back to South Africa. It's a very, very peculiar book, but a very fascinating one. And Gandhi is examining, as I said, what are the requirements for Indians to be truly free? Uh, and he makes some really interesting and fascinating claims, saying that if we can't do A, B, C, D, E, and so on, then we might as well not ask the British for freedom, because what's going to be the difference between them and us? Now here, he has a scathing critique of technology, of the idea of the nation state, and even of the model of parliamentary democracy. And I have to say on this, Gandhi has been prescient. Incidentally, if any of you are interested in, in you know, Indian politics, there's a fantastic series called Tandav, which is on Amazon Prime, and it's, it's accessible on Amazon Prime anywhere, which really tells you something about how within the structures of parliamentary democracy, you can you know, still have sort of violence and exploitation and so on. And, and all of these are a kind of scathing indictment of you know, Western modernity. Um, so... By this point of time, 
you know, Gandhi's realized that the British are not really going to give India anything like, uh, you know, what we may call shared governance, right, which is a term we are familiar with. Uh, before Gandhi, the nationalist movement was mostly led by Oxbridge educated, Western educated elite lawyers, and Gandhi was one himself. But what they were fighting for was some very limited amount of power and autonomy. And Gandhi realized that, you know, that's not going to cut it. You need complete independence. But what does complete independence mean? And this is where questions of technology, as much as the nation state and parliamentary democracy come in. So I'm just going to read, uh, you know, there's, there's a lot in the book. There's a few very fascinating passages, but I'm going to read one, one quote, one long quote. Uh, and just please bear with me. And this is symptomatic of, you know, what Gandhi has to say about medicine, etc. as well. So Gandhi focuses on the railways and the railways, again, as I said, are what made Gandhi. He says, it must be manifest to you that but for the railways, the English could not have a hold on India as they have. The railways too have spread the bubonic plague. And, you know, given what's going on with COVID, there's some very interesting parallels here. Without them, the masses could not move from place to place. The railways have increased the frequency of famines because owing to the facility of the means of locomotion, people sell out their grain and it's sent to the dearest markets. So instead of, you know, going to people in the community, it goes elsewhere. People become careless and the pressure of famine increases. The railways accentuate the evil nature of man. Bad men fulfill their evil designs with greater rapidity. The holy places of India have become unholy. Formerly people went to these places with great difficulty. Generally, therefore, only real devotees visited such places, and nowadays rogues visit them in order to practice their roguery. So it's, it's a very, very strange passage. And then Gandhi, you know, had similar objections to Western medicine, where he said that, you know, if you overeat, for instance, and Gandhi was obsessed with digestion, like many Indians, uh, I would say, uh, you know, he said, if you overeat, the body will punish you, you have consequences. But what happens with Western medicine is you can overeat and Western medicine or medicine, modern medicine will treat you and you'll be fine. So you're freed from the consequences of your actions. Uh, so, you know, how do we read this? And, and Gandhi has, you know, other stuff like this also in the book and elsewhere. Uh, he was, in terms of medicine, he was a believer in nature cure. Uh, now, cutting to the chase, Gandhi's argument really is that what technology does in this sense, modern industrial technology, is it destroys the human spirit. But how does it achieve or enable this destruction of the human spirit? So for Gandhi, very importantly, the essence of the human lay in human limitations. And what technology did was technology allowed you to overcome those limitations. And therefore, it unyoked you from all the natural limitations and rhythms into which you were organically embedded in the world and placed in relationships with other people. So these limits are bodily, right? Uh, and Gandhi, you know, had all these kinds of strange experiments with his body and other ground on which he's often been, you know, criticized. And there is some prurient interest about his, you know, sexual experiments, sleeping naked with his nieces and so on. So these limits are bodily. They're ecological limits. They're social, cultural, and economic. They link the human organically to his or her environment. Uh, technologies like the railway disrupt these natural rhythms of social existence and helping humans overcome limits and destroying what makes the human the human. So the objection to technology is that it enslaves humans, not that it causes unemployment. This is a very interesting point that a scholar Sahasra Buddha makes. Technology separates the self from the self. And what it does is it reduces the human just to a set of different capacities. Uh, and Gandhi here can be read productively in conversation with a range of thinkers, Marx on alienation, Heidegger's notion of technology as a kind of, as a kind of standing reserve, Foucault's uh, idea of biopower. Again, happy to talk about this in, in, in the question answer. So, uh, you know, in another five, seven minutes, I'll wrap up. Uh, now, this critique of technology itself is, is a critique of Western modernity because the disruption of limits is really key to the project of modernity, right? And this is what Marx also understood. It's a fantastic book about Marx, All That Is Solid by Marshall Berman, I think, where he talks about Marx actually 
you know, in some ways being much more admiring of what the bourgeois had done than someone like, you know, Adam Smith. But Marx understood that though ultimately this would come at a cost, uh, these advances were in the Marxist scheme of things necessary, a stage of history, but they had also brought advances. And a number of sociologists, theorists of modernity like Zimmel or Bourdieu say that if you look historically, the condition we call Western modernity really rests on the separation of human spheres of activity that over about you know 200 300 years maybe post 18th century you get this very differentiated kind of model of society in which the economy education culture they de develop a specialized semi-autonomous realms of fields um, and running with Bourdieu for a second on this the self becomes a kind of set of capacities so each of which is related to its own form of capital so you have economic capital, you have educational capital, you have cultural capital. And you know, like families from royalty who fall on hard days, you can still have cultural capital, but not have educational capital. But families that suddenly come into money are still not allowed, you know, into the highest realms of society. Uh, so the economic capital will not buy you cultural capital, right? So there are these kind of exchange rates between different forms of capital. And Gandhi's point is that the human cannot be reduced to any one kind of capital. It is beyond capital. So this is also related to Gandhi's critique of Western modernity. Uh, uh, sorry, it is uh, related to his, his critique of the Western idea of sovereignty and the idea of the nation state. Along with the Indian thinker Rabindranath Tagore, Gandhi was one of the two strongest critics of the idea of you know, nationalism. So modern political sovereignty is the notion of supreme authority within a territory. And Gandhi's argument is that modern political sovereignty necessarily rests on a loss of genuine individual sovereignty. When you see the power that the nation state has, and you can think of Max Weber's fav famous dictum here, that the state is the entity, the moral uh, the community that ha has the monopoly over the legitimate use of force or violence. So, sorry, I kind of, uh, inspired by my students tried to up my PowerPoint game and I put in one or two like silly moves. Uh, so Gandhi says that neither the nation state nor modern technologies can enable sovereignty of the self. Uh, in his vision of what I call a counter modernity, Gandhi envisioned India as this kind of decentralized republic of villages, concentric circles and concentric circles, each circle only making as much as it needed. Now, how do we read this? Because this sounds utopian and you know unrealistic. Uh, you know, there's no notion of sort of economics out here. Will it work on barter? And at the same time, Gandhi, for instance, was not opposed to a notion of you know capitalistic trusteeship. He was very close to one of India's great industrialists, G. D. Birla, and he believed in this sort of. At some points, you know, he made these statements that these capitalist factory owners, as they were, should sort of take on a, a well, welfareist patron role for the benefit of, of the workers. But really, the idea that we can take away from Gandhi here is that collective political freedom can only flow from radical individual self-rule, from control over the self, from thinking about your relationship to others and the environment. And that, for me, is the radical message of Gandhi. And that, for me, is also one way in which we need to think about what are we using technology for? What can we use technology for? So this counter modernity doesn't rule out modern or Western technologies, but rather it radically reorients the relationship of the self to technology. And there's just a quote here where, you know, Gandhi in the, his early years was absolutely adamant on following only what he called natural therapies, going to, you know, Veds or Hakims who are traditional Indian doctors. But by the 1920s or so, he, he, you know, he changed his view and he says that I want to pay my humble tribute to the spiritual spirit of research that fires, animates modern scientists. My quarrel is not against that spirit. My complaint is against the direction that the spirit has taken. So it's a kind of instrumental rationality, right? That, you know, you're just using this for material advancement. It's kind of the method becomes an end in itself. And Gandhi always insisted in any sphere of his life that the means matter as much as the ends. But he says that I have nothing but praise for the zeal, industry and sacrifice that have animated modern scientists in the pursuit after truth. So, you know, moving uh, 
to to conclude in the last couple of slides uh as i have been researching you know this this gandhi in in the context of my book uh, and for this presentation gandhi actually remains interestingly relevant digitally and beyond there was a story last year in an indian uh, publication which said that across the world gandhi is more popular than current political leaders if you look at data from google and wikipedia and gandhi you know again as with his critique of technology with his critique of sovereignty he can really be uh, you can bring him into like very interesting conversation with figures like karl schmidt who was the sort of theorist of the nazis as he's called and his notion of total power flowing from the sovereign is very popular now among the chinese uh, you know you think of edmund burke's amazing insight that sovereignty is born in violence that nations are born in violence and then they use this narrative to cast a veil over their violent origins and you look at the tragic founding history of america you look at the founding of modern india and pakistan with the partition violence of partition so gandhi asked us this question that what is a sovereignty that is not born in violence uh, he also anticipates the critique of the frankfurt school on the technological domination of nature and of thinkers like you know zygmunt bauman on the fact that the the logic of the holocaust was actually an industrial modern you know fordist logic of the assembly line so his technologies i would just say seem especially prescient you know whether with regard to the instrumental rationality that led to the bombing of hiroshima and nagasaki and you know more recently in light of the weaponization of social media uh, in india the us uh, you know uh, and elsewhere and i think on that note i'll just end so thank you very much i really do appreciate uh, you know, the patient listen and look forward to questions Thank you very much for it. And um, so, as I said, we have one question in the Q and A, but you can continue to post questions there. Um, and also, if you raise your hand, I'll be able to unmute you so you could ask a question that way as well. Um, so I'll go ahead and start with the first question um, we have with reference to Gandhi being relegated to stepfather status. Recent years have seen um, Ahmed Akar, sorry, I pronounce it, being propped up as another contender for father of the nation. Your thoughts? Um, sorry, Ambedkar. Yes, sorry. Yes. Uh, well, yes. I. So I, I. I would actually say that there is a stronger case for Ambedkar to be called the father of the nation. That you know Ramachandra Guha, who is one of India's leading historians and has uh, you know worked extensively on 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 modern Indian intellectual history, uh, says that Ambedkar for him is by far the greatest Indian thinker. Uh, and you know Gandhi's views on caste, for instance. Uh, can be seen as very problematic and, and Ambedkar did find those very troubling and Ambedkar in a sense anticipated uh, problems that Gandhi didn't see. Gandhi's belief always was that, uh, you know, the Hindu community and Indian community at large would reform by itself. And Ambedkar said, no, you need a Western, whether you want to call it Western or Indian, you need a Western rights based model. And by the end of his life, Ambedkar was so sort of dejected with what had happened that he converted to Buddhism because he was dismayed by that, that lack of, of change in Hinduism uh, and really by the insufficient you know, steps taken in terms of the modern sort of framework of the state. And today, when you look at what's happening with you know, Hindu nationalism, when you look at what's happening with attacks on Muslims, attacks on members of the Dalit, that's the formerly untouchable community, uh, you have to see that Ambedkar was absolutely right. So the romanticization of community, which Gandhi is, I think, guilty of. And to some extent, Gandhi acknowledged, but not completely. Uh, Ambedkar was spot on. And I, I think that that will be the battle. The idea of this social change coming in from a Gandhian model, it, Gandhi will play a key role, but I think Ambedkar needs to be the father of the nation. And someone once said that he's also the framer of the constitution. He was a great thinker and a radical thinker, but in our valorization of Ambedkar, we have reduced him to being a draftsman and he is much more. Superb question, thank you. Should answer. We, we have another question now. Um, can you please touch on the recent farmers' protests in India and how they relate to Modi's policies and technology? Um, all right. Yeah, absolutely. So, uh, you know, something very interesting happened. I wrote a piece about this. I was a few weeks ago, I was coming back uh, from Berkeley. There's an Indian restaurant there, Vicks, where I go quite frequently, my son and I, and uh, we're driving back. And uh, we got stuck in a protest, and the protest was led by Sikhs 
the Sikh community, many of whom who have relatives who are farmers. Uh, now, the thing is that the farm laws in India do need reforms. There's no question about that. Uh, that, you know, the, the, the way it stands currently that there are some farmers who get massive subsidies. Uh, large numbers of Indian farmers own very small plots of land. And, you know, they're just at the mercy of like the climate and so on and so forth. But the way in which these reforms were pushed through were undemo undemocratic. Uh, Kaushik Basu, who's a leading Indian economist, says that they will benefit big corporations. Um, so there's some case for the protests as, as well. Uh, now, to me, what's been very interesting about, uh, you know, the role of, uh, of, of technology there is that, uh, you know, the, the farm sector very much needs to be industrialized. It very much needs scale. Uh, some of the farmers who are kind of leading the protests already have those benefits, others don't. Others don't. Uh, so that's, I think, a really sort of important question that needs to be addressed. Uh, but, but how do you go about this and what's the most democratic way to go about this is really the burning kind of question. Uh, it's very interesting that technology and industrialization is still configured as a threat. And I think to some extent, the farmers are drawing on the tradition of Gandhi because for Gandhi, as for Nehru, but not for Ambedkar, the village was the soul of India. The final point I'll make is that the mainstream media in India today is completely, they completely kowtow to Modi and his right-hand man, henchman Amit Shah, uh, you know, who basically are running a mafia state. Let's just be very blunt about that. But social media has actually, and TikTok, TikTok, which is, you know, a medium I'm just sort of learning more about now, has been an amazing place for these narratives and uh, you know videos of farmers to gather major support. Great, thanks. Thanks for that answer. And another question: You said Gandhi would probably be canceled in today's culture. What do you think his success would have been like if he was born today? I think around today. What do you have had a great influence? Uh, it's you know it's well I it's a very, it's a very good question. I I think Gandhi was very strategic. I think he knew how to use the media of the times very well. Right. If you look at that painting, or the, the classic image of Gandhi, I think of it as a painting, you know, where he's sitting, looking at peace with himself, with his weaving loom. I increasingly come to think of that as like, it's a very staged photograph. Gandhi was posing, really. So I don't know, maybe he would have been very adept at the use of social media. Now his views, which evolved, right? He was puritanical in many of his views, his views which evolved. Uh, that's a more complicated question. And that I think is a question that goes to the heart of woke culture, right? Which is that, you know, are people allowed to have views that are not palatable, right? Does, does the fact that you have a troubling view on a topic of matter of identity or rights or discrimination, does it sum you up as a person, right? And is that what your legacy will ultimately be judged by? And it's not an easy question. I don't have an answer to it. So would he be allowed to have a platform to begin with up beyond a point? I don't know. Would he have adapted well to technology even as he criticized it? I'm absolutely sure. Thanks. Um, let me just check. Um, I don't see any hands or questions, but I, I, I'll take the liberty of, of being the moderator and ask a question myself, which is sure. um, if you think about, you know, the railways and kind of disconnecting people from their limits and we think about social media generally, oh, I'll ask this and I'm sure that's a question. Too. Um, you know, how do you think that plays into the kind of extremism that emerges from or the, you know, the, the attack on the capital or the rise in nationalism and kind of um, right wing ideologies in general. I mean, how do you, do you think those two things are related to Gandhi's critique of the railways and how social media affects society today? Absolutely. So when you think about, I think his point about mobility, right? That what happens is that you can, your, the consequences of your actions can be divorced from your actions, right? And in some ways, what that, what the railways are doing, his argument there is that, uh, you know, if you, if you wanted to make a pilgrimage and making a pilgrimage in the Indian context got you some karma, right? Which is again, karma is a sort of complex concept, but in, in the popular sort of post hippie imagination, it, it refers to kind of an accumulation of points like sky miles. But the thing is that the significance of the pilgrimage is in the journey, right? It's in the effort that you take to walk there. And Gandhi's point is that someone can just do a terrible deed, hop onto a train, go to a shrine, pray there, ask for forgiveness, and then come back. 
And, and that's kind of what you see with, you know, happening in social media. It's very interesting when you read the rhetoric of so many of these, uh, you know, protesters and the rioters at the, who were involved in the capital uh, attack. Uh, they, you know, they keep saying that, you know, it went out of hand. It went out of hand. I didn't expect it to go out of hand, right? Now, is that uh, a justification or is that is that some kind of like defense? But I think there is an element of truth there that, you know, these, these things just kind of take on a, a life of their own. Um, and and the, the scholar Cass Sunstein has called these cyber cascades. He said that these are these cyber cascades. So I think Gandhi, he noticed this happening in a non sort of technological way also. There's a very famous incident where protests against the British in a town called Chauri Chora turned very violent. And the Indian protesters, they set fire to a mob, to, to the police station and the police policemen inside were burnt alive. And Gandhi called off the protest. He said that this is not okay. And I think he sees technology as a kind of instrument of that. And I think he would say that that's what happened with social media as well. So one question is who's responsible? The platforms are not claiming responsibility. The people there are saying we are not responsible. So this is violence without responsibility, right? Or without accountability. I think there's a question on uh, the chat also. Sure, yeah. So Srila has a question. Um, can you talk more about women in the independent struggle who may not have exalted Gandhi? Um, why not? Um, you mentioned Naidu. Uh, yeah, because absolutely, I think Gandhi's, you know, idea of the family was a very conservative idea of the family. And Gandhi's expectation of women and even of, you know, children uh, was, uh, I, I think, in many ways troubling. You see this in the film Gandhi, it's, it's sort of brought out quite well. Uh, and, and I think Gandhi was not entirely kind of free, his thinking was not free of, of a certain kind of romanticization of uh, you know, the nation has kind of feminized, right? And, you know, ideas about female honor or about female assertion or independence or sexuality. So that's why, you know, for, for women, for the women's movement in India, for, uh, you know, members of the Dalit community, uh, Gandhi is, I think, a, a much more problematic figure than he would be for, for others. Uh, I think Peter has a question. Yeah. I can shall I read it out on... Um, I can read or you can read oh, either way. So. Go ahead, Aaron. Okay, Please. sorry. What do you think of Gandhi's view against science and technology in today's world? Um, apparently, technology has significantly improved communications to enhance human knowledge, broaden perspectives, and reduce division, bigotry, as well as discrimination, among many other things that Gandhi promoted. Um, what do you make of that contradiction? It is a contradiction. I think Gandhi was aware of it. And I think Gandhi did not want in his being in his thinking and in his uh, in his statements to even seed anything that the British could claim credit for. So the unequivocal opposition must be seen in terms of Gandhi's, you know, strategic uh, kind of and, and, and I think very, very uh, focused opposition to British rule, right? So that's why Gandhi wore that loin cloth. When you compare him to Dr. Ambedkar, Dr. Ambedkar was always dressed in a suit because his point was that the you know, traditional clothing in some ways represents this hierarchy which sees untouchables as less than human. Uh, and and uh, you know, I think Ambedkar would agree with the point that Peter is making. So what Ambedkar said is for him, villages were the soul of like oppression, not the soul of India. And what Ambedkar told members of the Dalit community was, he said, leave the villages and go to the city. So all the things that to some extent modernity and technology empower, which is mobility, anonymity, very importantly, right? We know that sort of the great, you know, sociologists of the 20th century, like Durkheim and others spoken, and, or even Marx earlier have spoken about alienation and anomie, right? But that anonymity, Ambedkar said, was liberating. Nobody knows your caste in the cities, right? Get onto a train and go away. Right, because in the villages you will be oppressed by people. So I think this is an, this point is very well taken, and I think this is a very very valid critique of Gandhi. And Nehru was much more. Nehru was, of course, the great believer in science and the scientific temper. So he was he was the you know the absolute antithesis of Gandhi in this regard, almost to to a fault. Any other questions? Um... None right now. Um, I, I might not ask another question, and then this is um, so. What then? You know, 
you think about Burke and historians often get the question like what what would someone say about this to at this moment but I think just in general think about Gandhi's reaction your own reaction how is it that we have a productive or a successful relationship with technology that doesn't kind of disappropriate you know tear apart the self in, in ways that Gandhi might critique I mean what does that relationship look like in, from your perspective as a scholar on these subjects thank you it's a question I've actually been thinking a lot about so the question is who has sovereignty over ourselves today, right? right. Now, um, you know, uh, we, we, we actually have a, a graduate from the communication department who was one of the early employees of Google. And a few years ago, Father Sukup, uh, there was a, a conference of scholars from different Jesuit schools held at Santa Clara. He had very kindly organized an event at Google. And, uh, you know, I, I, he kindly invited me to participate as well. And uh, the people at Google were talking about how, you know, we take your data, but we do good with it. And I, I, the question I asked them and others asked them is, but did we ever give you permission? And they said, no, but they, they, they just could not get it. They're like, yes, but we're going to use this information for medical benefits and so on. Right. And I said, yes, but you make a profit still. And it's not a question that, you know, Silicon Valley likes to answer. And frankly, even the criticism of Silicon Valley that we see, especially here, in the valley itself at universities and so on is so muted it's so gentle as to almost be a compliment now because they aren't laws on the books and we know this happens with regulation right regulation is always playing catch up because it's not technically illegal doesn't mean it's completely unethical so what's happened is with data mining right with constant surveillance with these profiles that are made one million factors is what plus is what you know facebook uses to sort of develop profiles we have completely ceded sovereignty over the self so there's two or three ways of thinking about it. I think at the philosophical level, and you know, I'm not, <clears throat> I worked in the internet industry that was, uh, you know, the, my job before I came to graduate school and decided to study it. And I, uh, you know, I, I know some, you know, coding and, and, and have done some developing and so on, but I'm not from a technical background as such. For me, the philosophical question is that, you know, what is sovereignty over the self? Who has autonomy over yourself, your representation? Right. And your, if you think about the data, or the traces that you leave of your life, that is an extension of yourself. Now, who gave any of these companies permission? Right. The other thing is that there is an exploitative dimension to it. And Shiva Vedyanathan has an argument, which is actually Marx's argument, where he says that the whole sort of critique in media studies and of cultural imperialism uh, about content is a little misplaced, like the people who control the infrastructure which is, you know, Google, the so-called pipes of the internet are the ones who have the power. And it's basically the Marxist argument about the means of production, right? So uh, if you have that kind of power, what is your responsibility? Now, I think this is a question that there's a legal dimension to it. And, you know, we have scholars at Santa Clara and so on. There's a debate about Section 230. Uh, the most crucial question for me really is what is the responsibility of the platforms and this complete myth of platform neutrality? Right. Uh, I don't think platforms are neutral at all. I don't think algorithms are neutral. And I think all of them can be related. The critique can be related back in Gandhian terms to this whole question of sovereignty uh, that, you know, are we really sort of free if every action of ours is being you know, monitored, monetized? What does autonomy mean? And the profound irony here is that all these companies, they come from this Silicon Valley techno libertarian or utopian techno libertarianism or techno utopianism of you know the information wants to be free self wants to be free and so on so that would be my my response thanks so much um that's a great answer we're coming up on um an hour and i know for zoom an hour is often uh kind of when we're starting our limits so are, are there any final questions anyone would like to ask i would just want to give an opportunity um and if you have any final thoughts, um, just things you would like to highlight as we leave, maybe um, we could wrap up there. Sure. No, I, I mean, thank you again to everyone. Thank you to the you know center uh, and the forum. And if, you know, any thoughts, questions, critiques that people have, I'm, I'll be very interested in hearing them. So please feel free to, you know, dash me an email. This is, I'm just thinking through these questions as much as anyone else is. Great. Thanks so much, Anne. We really appreciate you taking the time to, to do this. And like I said, it's a long time in the making, but I'm glad we were able to finally make it happen because I think that's an important part of this conversation about, you know, what is the human spirit? How do we flourish? And what is that relationship to technology? Because we're we can't, we're not gonna get away. Um, we can't get away from technology. We can't act like it doesn't exist. So we have to find that balance of relationship. So thank you very much. Thanks. Thanks. Thanks for everyone for being here. <laughs>